So hello everybody and welcome to the next one of our uh, video blogs from the Orca Project. My name is David Lane. I'm one of the founding directors of the Edinburgh Centre for Robotics and director of the Orca Hub. Um, if you don't know about Orca Hub, it's the largest uh, research hub in the world looking at the applications of robotics and artificial intelligence to offshore energy. And it's my great pleasure today to welcome my good friend and colleague, and also co-director and founder of the Edinburgh Centre for Robotics at the University of Edinburgh, Professor Sethu Vijayakuma. So welcome Sethu, it's great to see you here today. Uh, where does this video log find you? I am in lovely Edinburgh in my uh, living room and uh, it's, it's surprisingly nice and sunny. Good. So we've all been working in sort of lockdown situation for the last, uh, last few months, getting back to it now. Um, we're going to talk today about uh, shared autonomy and motion control. Um, and Seth has been working in this area and the application of machine learning to robot motion control for over 20 years. Actually, you've been doing it all your life, Seth, you said, so you know, for, for the longest That's time. Great. So, you know, it's great to, have, great to have you here to talk about this. You know, we're, we're in the Orca, we're in the business of doing, you know, world-leading use-inspired science before we spiral it into use cases and applications where it can be used. So, you know, what I'd love to hear about from you, Seth, who in the audience as well, is what are you working on, what's exciting you, and, and what are the things you think are going to be game-changing from the scientific point of view uh, in the work you've been carried out, you've been carrying out. Seth? Who? Yeah. Thank, that, thank you, David. Uh, and I think, again, it's a huge pleasure to try and get across the excitement of the research that we're doing here as part of the Orca Hub. Uh, we're doing cutting edge research and, and I think um, hopefully I'll be able to get that across to you. So let me start by just quickly sharing my screen uh, and hopefully you'll be able to see that. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, as a group we've been doing for many, many years now is the application of machine learning to smart planning and control of various robotic platforms, be it wheeled, legged, fixed base systems. So in particular, for in, in relevance to the Orca Hub, uh, there are two things I want to get across in this vlog here today. Um, one is the importance of this concept of shared human robot collaboration or what we call shared autonomy. And the second is the challenges facing moving sensors around the world um, in, in complex environments and cluttered environments. So let me start by telling you a little bit about teleoperation autonomy and shared autonomy. So on the one extreme, you have robots that can be told what to do, can be teleoperated using uh, either joysticks or different um, modes of input, like um, using your body as an input device. Uh, on the other hand, there's some research that we've been doing over the past few years, uh, which is focusing on getting more autonomy to robotic platforms. In other words, getting robots to make decisions on their own. But really, I think the real big challenge in being able to deploy robots efficiently and quickly is what I term as shared collaborative autonomy. So why do I say that is important? Why do I say collaborative shared autonomy is important? And that's because if you look at the list of application domains I have put up on this slide, um, there are some scientific reasons why achieving the goals of these domains are quite hard to do by using either of the two extremes of teleoperating the device with the joystick or other input devices, or by getting the robot to do it fully autonomously. And the, the challenges arise from real world interactions, noisy and ambiguous sensing, as well as things like um, you know, user intentions. You've got human, humans and other actors in the loop and modeling their intentions are quite hard. So that's where the kind of concept of collaborative uh, and robots and humans working together come, to, uh, come, come into the picture. And um, as David mentioned, our group uh, at the University of Edinburgh, in particular, my research group has been focusing on applying various machine learning technologies to the domain of robotics and autonomous systems to achieve this vision of shared autonomous control. So um, 
very briefly, um, the kind of topics or the, the things that we've been working on is clever techniques for doing machine learning for perception of localization and scene understanding, um, adaptive whole body motion planning for dynamic situations, uh, and ensuring that robots act in a safe way when interacting with other robots and humans. And with the aim of being able to seamlessly shift between these different levels of autonomy. And I'll give you a very concrete example uh, of that um, different punctuated autonomy levels. So on, you will see a video in a moment where on the screen on the left is what a robot potentially acting in a different room or a different city or a different um, planet, for example, is going to look like, whereas a user console is going to look like what's on, this, on the right. So in real time, the robot in the remote site is making decisions uh, about how to navigate without bumping into objects, how to remove obstacles in its ways, do real time motion planning without the human having to actually specify exactly what actions to take. The humans, on the other hand, is getting feedback by using this digital twin model that the robot builds in real time. And he or she is giving a very high level command about what the robot needs to achieve. And perhaps uh, in between give some validation in terms of whether it has achieved what it needs to do. So in a way, uh, this is enabling the robot to make local decisions on its own without the need to have a very high bandwidth communication, but at the same time, allowing a person or operator to validate these things um, with minimal cognitive load on the person. So this is this whole concept of applying machine learning technologies to this concept of shared autonomy, where we are blending between teleoperation and autonomous and fully autonomous behaviors. Great, I agree Great. completely. And uh, what really intrigues me about this is that, you know, in some situations, you know, an opera, the work, particularly where the task is quite complicated, then it might be a bit much for the planning to do. So the operator has to take control, or indeed where there's some difficult manipulation and that you know that we don't have all the planning for it. Um, but in other situations, the machine can take on reliably take on a lot of the task and the operator can can relax if that's the right if that's the right word so i really see the benefit of this and why in a range of applications we want to be able to change from one kind of autonomy to another in the shared autonomy mode but i guess the question is for orca and for the offshore energy industry how is this going to be relevant in the future how, how are we going to use this in order to um, uh, improve or develop or help the way offshore operations are carried out. Thanks for that question, David. And I have a slide uh, exactly for that. So as you mentioned, um, so one of the goals or the challenges uh, of the Orca Hub is how to deploy uh, technologies like uh, robotic manipulation of sensors and um, as well as uh, interaction with structures on the uh, platform using robotic platforms, but make sure that these ro robots do not become the weak link because there's no point deploying some fancy technology uh, and uh, you have to spend all your time and energy trying to get the robots to act reliably. So, so that's exactly where we are taking this work within Orca Hub. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll first start by showing you uh, an example of a wheel system um, which we have now used in the real mock trials um, in, with, with the Orca Hub on trying to deploy some of the sensors that have been developed as part of the Orca Hub on realistic structures. In this case, an example of a mock-up of, um, of a tank. Uh, and the idea is um, if we have a setting where this, these platforms can be used to very, uh, you know, uh, seamlessly deploy these sensors with minimal human intervention, with the human just giving the high level goals. Uh, but here, the main idea is use this concept called whole body motion planning. So in other words, not just the wheels moving first, stopping, then the arms working, and then uh, putting the sensors on. So this is an example of how we can use seamlessly the, the, the complete body to optimize both the accuracy and the timing of the placement of uh, these sensors. 
And this technology is not just relevant to applications here, but we've deployed this on uh, or worked closely with other um, people like Hitachi for the warehousing setting and for Honda for using this technology for the assembly line. So in those kind of settings, uh, a 20% increase or ef of efficiency in terms of time is a massive win. And that's where this technology can be deployed across domains. And the other setting uh, that I wanted to point out is if you go from wheel systems to systems that are legged, they have the advantage of being able to navigate scenarios that are not necessarily flat, that are not necessarily built for robots. Um, so platforms like steps, um, which are built for humans. So the whole idea is we want to create robust navigation capabilities for moving sensors around uh, in, in complex settings like the slippery environment, for example. So a lot of research going towards doing that. And, uh, and one particular um, scientific output I want to highlight here in this vlog is a recent um, output from the Orca Hub that we've published in the IROS, uh, one of the primary uh, research uh, uh, conferences in, in our field. Uh, and, and this nicely highlights the point of the, the scientific point of this uh, Orca Hub. So people say there are many, many different kinds of legged robots around. So you've already seen it walk around. So what's the point? Uh, you know, isn't it a solved problem? The, the point is that uh, if you think about getting a robot to move something um, there are many different ways of doing it, but to choose which is the most robust way of moving in order to be able to tackle any future disturbances that the robot may, uh, may encounter while being on, say, an offshore platform, or maybe taking into the capability of the legs or the power, the torque that is generated in a, in a robot arm to figure out under different environmental circumstances, like for example, on a ramp or in a valley setting, uh, can we find robust metrics where we choose the best scenario that the robot can use to manipulate things very robustly? So this is a first in the world in terms of putting arms on legged systems and getting it to work in real time in a very robust fashion. So this, the, the example that you see now is a robot on a kind of a skateboard. And this is almost replicating a scenario as you would have when uh, an offshore platform is moving uh, or swaying. And can we get robust behaviors in this kind of settings? Wow, that's, that's great to see, particularly the, the high degrees of freedom in the quadruped with the arm as well. That's uh, quite a lot to, uh, to deal with. So you've kind of taken the, my next question away from me. So, what, <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, there's things, still things you want to get to grips with. It's not a solved problem, even though we're doing world first, which is great to see uh, from, the, from the Center for Robotics in Edinburgh. Give, it up, give us a plug. So uh, the scientific challenges then, Seth, tell us about what's still to yeah. be done and what's out there. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you and me are in the business of doing uh, good science. And if all the problems were solved, then we'd be out of a job. But uh, I think there's lots of interesting new open challenges. And I want to highlight three points here. Um, it's kind of a little bit like a call to action in terms of what are open areas that I mean I would love people to work on, both with us and around in, in, the, in the robotics community. Uh, the one is about safe actuation. So if we want to deploy robots in the real world, then uh, sort of making it safe uh, for humans, for other robots, for other structures is very, very important. You can do it in one of two ways. You can do it in software. So you can have systems which adapt in real time to novel environments. So we have lots of work in, in model predictive control with learned dynamics to be able to adapt to novel situations, novel lo loads and things like that. Um, I mean, we have been doing that work. Others in the, in, in the domain have been doing a lot of work in this area. But in particular, uh, our research group has a world leading expertise in the use of compliant actuation. So things like how can we use um, springs in between actuation systems and motors to not only create safe interactions, but effectively use the springs to do energy efficient actuation. So that is one big area that we kind of excel in uh, and uh, have world leading expertise in. The other bit uh, that I want to focus on is uh, we have lots of world 
leading cutting edge platforms in our labs uh, in, in the Edinburgh Center for Robotics as part of our living labs. Um, but we never have enough uh, data or we cannot test our real hardware um, robots uh, in, in enough different kinds of scenarios to, to guarantee that it will always work well uh, in, in, in all the possible scenarios that we will see deployed in. Um, so in particular, given the current situation where we do not have access to the labs due to the pandemic, uh, it becomes quite hard to make progress if you rely 100% on um, you know, running the hardware. So that's where this whole concept of digital twins become really, really important. Uh, and it's not a new concept. People have been using simulations for ages, but always there's a big gap between a sim what we call the sim to real gap between um, what actually you can simulate and what um, is the reality when we deploy it on real robots. So we have been working very hard to reduce the sim to real gap by modeling things like friction, dynamics, contacts, uh, much more reliably, much more efficiently. And this is a super important area because uh, we, we want to make sure we can test at scale and deploy uh, across domains. And the last bit is, is about um, the messaging you want to get across. So uh, as scientists, uh, when we write a paper, we always say, my technology is the best, we, it can do this, this and that. Uh, Unfortunately, there's not enough uh, emphasis given on trying to understand the uh, limitations of certain systems. So the vulnerabilities and the limitations of our deployed systems. And that's very important. So if something fails, we need systems that are explainable, that can tell us uh, why it has failed. Uh, and we can trace back the causal reasoning behind that so that we can make sure we test and deploy the same mistake doesn't happen again. So a huge emphasis on verifiable and explainable methods are important. Brilliant, that's great. And it's good to hear the work you're doing on digital twins. I can't help but remember, we're recording this just as we're coming out of lockdown in the pandemic in the summer of 2020. And if we cast our minds back maybe three months, we were asked, weren't we, to, could we repurpose some of this technology in our robots to go and uh, work in the local hospitals in Scotland to do disinfecting? And because we didn't have all our digital twin technology properly worked up, and we didn't have access to the labs at the time, we weren't able to respond. So, uh, you know, the time it was going to take us months rather than weeks or days, which is what the government really needed. So this work on digital twins and developing that ability to close the, the simulated to real gap is going to be really important in the future to make us more responsive, more resilient um, in the way that we can pivot what we do to different applications. Um, and do it quickly. So that's, that's to other exogenous shocks, as people have taught me to say about the, about the pandemic. Fabulous, that's great. So um, are there ways that um, people can come and work in your group and get involved with what you do? What's next and what, what are the things that Absolutely. you need uh, to develop the work further? Excellent. So, so one quick thing uh, before I oh, get to the, the link is um, some things that we haven't talked about in this vlog, and I think it's very important to get across, right. is that whenever we deploy real world technology uh, and sort of look at kind of pushing technology, there are a few other things that I think we have to be very careful about. And it's about, uh, you know, things like moral and ethical uh, use of AI uh, in, in, in some of these technologies. And um, when we have uh, uh, robots and any other autonomous systems making decisions on, on its own. We want to make sure these machine learning algorithms are developed in a way that these decisions do not disadvantage a particular uh, community or a particular um, group of people. So, so there are there are some challenges uh, in in developing new uh, technology, machine learning technology, even whether whether it's in the social media setting or even in the sort of robotics and AI setting. Um, so. And the other things that's listed here are things like security, responsibility, and explainability I already mentioned. And also, also this, when we talk about shared control, when do we share control? How fast do we share transfer control? How do we get back control? And in learning systems, you know, when things are constantly evolving, how do we make sure it's safe? So those are open, interesting, open questions. And 
at the Orca Hub and the Edinburgh Centre for Robotics, we are collaborating with a bunch of institutions. Uh, for example, the Alan Turing Institute, um, that uh, where I co-direct the AI program, um, which are focusing on very specific aspects of uh, moral and ethical ways of reducing bias in artificial intelligence systems and learning systems. So please do check us out um, in terms of the research that we're doing there. And finally, uh, I just wanted to put up this, uh, this web link, uh, the, 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 the sort of web link that now on the screen uh, is the link to our group site where we have all the exciting platforms that we work with, all the research, and also lots of new opportunities, both as part of the Orca Hub and also as part of other uh, ISCF hubs and the Turing Initiative. We've got lots of opportunities for postdocs, PhD students, and as, as well as as part of the Edmund Center for Robotics to come and work with us on, on exciting research, exciting platforms, uh, and try to solve, uh, solve all, the, all the exciting problems that, uh, that we have. Wonderful. That's great. And um, really is world leading research, Sethu. Um, you know, to see world first being demonstrated is always wonderful. Um, and I know as well as, you know, looking for top people to come and work and study in the centre and work in your group, you know, we're always interested in uh, other industries with problems where they think this technology might be relevant. You mentioned earlier on some supply chain type applications. So, uh, you know, as beyond uh, working in uh, offshore energy and indeed nuclear is another area I know that you're active in, you haven't said anything about it today. You know, so, you know, there's lots of other ways this technology is going to get used. And actually part of the exciting part is to find out what that actually is, you know, as, as we go forward in, in our developments, both of uh, Orca, the Edinburgh Centre for Robotics and the National Robotarium, which is our, our new translational facility. We've got new buildings coming up uh, as part of the centre. Shortly next year, they should be open and we'll have a lot more living labs and a lot more industrial engagement um, around these things that we do. So listen, Sethu, thank you very much. It's great to have spent time together um, and it's been great to hear about ev everything you're doing. Um, if people, if you want to find out more about the work, not just of Sethu, but of the whole of the, of the Orca Hub and the Centre for Robotics and our colleagues in our partner, uh, universities in apart from Edinburgh and Harriet Watt, but also in Liverpool, in Oxford and Imperial College. Then if you go to the web and you go to orcahub.org, say that again, orcahub.org, you'll see a load of resources there that will tell you about uh, everything that we're doing. So thank you, Sethu. Thank you, everybody, for uh, tuning in and uh, best wishes for your well-being in the future. Thank you. Thank you.